I'm Dennis Anderson along with Julie Zenner and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. Thousands of Duluth residents got an unwelcome letter from the city this week. We'll have the latest on an email phishing scam that exposed information in the city clerk's office. An updated web tool unveiled this week can help economic development officials find just the right property for a new business. And with the start of the Minnesota firearms deer season just hours away, some helpful tips from the Minnesota DNR. Ah, uh, these stories and more are coming up on Almanac North. Hello again and welcome to Almanac North. Thank you very much for watching. And Julie, this is going to be an unseasonably warm opening weekend for the Minnesota deer hunt. So often it's so cold for them out there. I'm sure that some are really appreciating it. Uh, I don't have to wear the big mittens tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll have a lot more on that later, but first, our first topic. All right. Thank you, Denny, and welcome everyone. It was revealed this week the city of Duluth fell victim to an email phishing scam in August that may have exposed some sensitive private information. More than 55,000 voters and hundreds of businesses were notified by the city that private information may have been exposed in the scam. And it comes at a time of heightened concerns about potential election fraud nationwide. Well, joining us with more is Emily Larson, mayor of the city of Duluth. And thanks for being here. Yeah, mayor thank Larson. you for having me. Talk about the, the phishing scam. What was it and how was it discovered by the city? Yeah, so phishing scam is when an entity comes in and, and is kind of dangling, wants you to take a bite, <laughs> right? It's, it's exactly what it sounds like. So um, we did have an employee within city staff who, um, you know, er erroneously mm -hmm. or, you know, uh, on accident, unintentionally provided mm -hmm. access to their email account. So really what we ended up having was an outside entity getting access to one enclosed email account within the city of Duluth. Not further IT systems, not further into our system. And so what we had was uh, one email account that we had to go through entirely. So sure. we had to look at sent mail, drafted mail, deleted mail, archived mail. We had to look at every single attachment to see what could have potentially been accessed because what we have learned is that all we can kind of ascertain is what has potentially been accessed for people. Yeah. Have you taken safeguards to prevent mm -hmm. this from happening again? Yeah, we have. And actually, this is, we have really strong protocols in place. That in this particular instance, we had an employee who had several screens open working with IT remotely uh, to mm -hmm. identify something. And so it was a perfect opportunity for that unintentional screen to pop up. So what we did was spent the time we needed to do to understand the information, understand the potential risks. Uh, for most people, it's very uh, contained information, a voter file, a voter identification file, which is really your birth date, your name, your address. Most of that is public information. Uh, your birth date is not. Your birth year is public information. Mm -hmm. Your birth date is not. So for most people, their risk is actually very, very low. It doesn't matter. It's our job to, uh, to you know, relay that information, provide people with uh, information on how they can manage their risk and in some of the cases where we had higher profile uh, potential information that was leaked we are providing fraud protection for mm -hmm. businesses. There, there's been so much talk at the national level mm -hmm. about potential voter fraud yep. with the election coming up. Any concerns related to this phishing incident about that compromising the election here in the city of Duluth? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I'm glad you asked it so directly because there is no concern, and I want to talk about that a little bit. Mm -hmm. We worked very closely with the Duluth Police Department, with the mm -hmm. FBI, with our county, uh, with the county who helps manage elections, and the Secretary of State, who then did their own independent um, research to determine that not only was the information within the state voter file never accessed, uh, so it's pure and it's untouched, but there was no strange activity 
around that information. So we have we have good confidence that this voter list that is out is clean, it is pure, is, it is untouched, as verified by the Secretary of State's office, so people can feel very confident. And I have to tell you, we have had close to 7,000 people come in and vote early um, and absentee. So people are still exercising their right mm -hmm. to vote, knowing that that is a good, clean list. Mm -hmm. So it sounds, Mayor, as if the average person really doesn't have much to worry about, if anything to worry about? Well, that is how I feel. Now, it's my job to make sure that we cleanly and clearly provide the information. And I do feel confident that for the most part, I would say 54,000 and 800 people have a very, very, very yeah. low risk of information. It is their birth, their specific birth date. That's uncomfortable information if you haven't chosen to give that There were out. 400 and some businesses, though, that were compromised a bit more. Yeah, fewer tell us than about that? that. Yeah, fewer than that. Um, but yes, we had some licensing application that was also found within. Of course, we have to go through, a, a, as you remember, an entire email account. So an email account can, in this case had 8,000 emails and information in there. You, we have to go through everyone individually. So there was some licensing information in there. We have taken a good care of individually reaching out to these businesses and providing uh, fraud protection so that people can feel confident that we are doing our part. We regret this. There is no question mm -hmm. about that. This is not information that I want to share. It is not information we want as people are feeling heightened and anxious before a national election that feels really negative. It is what the information is. And at that point, it's our it's our responsibility to hold ourselves accountable, to relay that information, and then to provide resources for people to get additional information on how they can manage their risk. Did the fact that there is an election coming up influence the way that you responded to this publicly? No, it didn't at all. In fact, um, you know, we tried to get this out as quickly as we could for, for two reasons. One is people have a right to know. Mm -hmm. The second is that we didn't want this to be perceived at all as being tied to something political or something on the national level. And so uh, while it is never information you want to give, and there's never a good time to, to share that information, doing it one week ahead of a national election may not be ideal. I can tell you doing it a week after is even less <laughs> ideal. And so we worked as hard as we could to get it out. And, and we entertained for like a millisecond. It wasn't even entertaining. When we talked about timing, it was unanimous. We get this out as fast as we can with the clarity that mm -hmm. we can. We are not hanging on to this information for the sake of, of something like that. Mm -hmm. And the person or persons who broke into the system or got into the system, uh, they're not from this country. No, they aren't. And they, you know, we have provided all information to the FBI yeah. and, the, and the Duluth from Police Ghana, Department. From Ghana, I believe. Yeah. And, and actually what we have found is that there were a series of spam emails that went out. We think that that is why they were looking for emails to continue their phishing and do mm -hmm. other things. But at any rate, it's good. It's really good to have this out. Uh, uh, the first day we provided a hotline and information for people. The first day we had quite a few calls coming, yeah. which is great. Um, today calls were, I mean, we were down to less than 20, 20 phone mm -hmm. calls or probably 25 phone calls we got from people. So I think people are getting the information they need. Bottom line, no other files are at risk? No, correct. Correct. Bottom line, no other, um, no other boundaries within the city confines of IT have been at risk. We feel good about that. We are, of course, always looking at our protocols and what we can do differently because we do not want to do this again. Mm -hmm. Let's change the subject. You were named one of the top 100 people to know yes. in Minnesota by yeah. Twin Cities Business That is magazine. changing the subject. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's different. I mean, that, that has to be fairly flattering. I'm wondering if yeah. you're having all sorts of new people asking to be your Facebook friend. No, and connecting no, with you. <laughs> no. Um, yes, no, that's a wonderful honor. I'll be down in Minneapolis. Uh, Doug and I will go down in December to be part of the Twin City Business Magazine magazine celebration and and that is wonderful I think it's a really nice accomplishment for our community you know I'm new in this work I think it's recognition that the work that I'm doing is is supporting our continued economic growth and small business and large business growth I also know it is a recognition of the very hard work our community has done over several years the mm -hmm. young women's initiative conference yeah. the governor has asked you to serve on that conference yeah. what is it all about well it's new so I'm gonna learn more about what it's all about but Governor Dayton for the first time put together a young women's initiative leadership initiative and, and I've been invited to join that there are 40 leaders from across the state a few who are elected leaders others are community or corporate leaders and then young women um, and the idea is that we will build strategies to help ensure that there is 
a greater opportunity for leadership for women across the state of Minnesota, and in particular for women of color in the state of Minnesota. And so our job, we will be tasked with mm -hmm. um, developing strategies on how that can happen. Um, and I'm really very excited about that. I'm, I'm looking forward to getting to work. What are some of the things that uh, you would like to bring to that discussion? Well, I think I can talk a little bit about what my own experience was as mm -hmm. a path towards leadership. But um, And in that case, I do a lot of mentoring with women who seek political office, and so I can bring some of that. But um, I do know and I have seen in this work how much it makes a difference to see people who reflect you in leadership. And so some of what I hope to bring to that is just um, the reality that political leadership is, is a very realistic path of leadership for women. And, and it is really through relationship building that people kind of see that that, that is something that mm -hmm. they can attain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A couple of road projects. The 4th Street project, yeah. that's still, a, what, a year away before that's finished? Well, it <laughs> doesn't... <laughs> <laughs> I'm joke? asking. A, there's, a, there's a question in there. Well, we are working on that, and actually, that's that is a county project, so they would be the best entity to really okay. get firm timelines on. But okay. um, and it's this is one of the reasons why it's great to have a good working relationship with St. Louis County, and their sales tax is helping to pay for that. So that's that's a great project. Another one is, uh, of course, as you head out west, Grand yeah. Avenue. That's nearly done. It's wonderful. So there's there's a little more work they have to do, but we did just celebrate that the biggest chunk is done in front of the zoo. That is a MnDOT project, and again. Uh, Minnesota Department of Transportation. It was over a $3 million project of that we were able to make possible. Um, we applied to them for a grant and then we were able to pour it back into the sure. into the project. And that is, that's a wonderful enhancement to the St. Louis River Corridor investments that we're doing in West Duluth. But big thanks to the community because that, that's a tricky project. It's a main artery. There's not much you can do without Grand Avenue. It required a lot of patience on everyone's part and it's a beautiful project. All right, Mayor Emily Larson, thank, thank you. you so much for coming in on Thanks. a Friday night. Appreciate Thanks. it. Thank you very much. Good to have you. Now, let's dig into our news file archive for a look at what was making news 25 years ago this week. The biggest storm of the century is now over and Duluth residents are beginning the enormous task of digging out. Northlanders are known for their tenacity when nature throws them a curve, but three feet of snow can cause more trouble than any hardy soul can handle alone. Around here we're helping some people shovel their cars out and stuff. So it's been overall just a, a nice experience. True, uh, true Duluth winter, I think. And after three days of tossing snow, most of us are getting used to the feel of a shovel in our hands. I started about Thursday. Actually, Friday morning, I waited Thursday. Shoveled a little Thursday, Friday, some Saturday, and most of it today. And as soon as this plow comes by again, I'll get to shovel one more time. This is really important because it'll give the people who've, whose cars are hung up in snow banks and windrows and snow drifts a chance to shovel them out. It'll also give the city crews an opportunity to plow at least one good driving lane down the, uh, each of the city streets. Everyone involved in the storm cleanup agrees that if people can be patient a little while longer, life in Duluth will get back to normal. Kathy Evangelista, KBLH News. Well, an upgraded website that is a key tool for economic development in the region was unveiled this week. The Northland Connection website is the business and economic development portal for seven counties in northeastern Minnesota and also Douglas County, Wisconsin. Now, the website can pinpoint available property, outline demographic information, and provide other data useful for businesses looking to locate or expand. Now, here to tell us more is Carl Shuttler, who is with the North Span Group and is the Northland Connection Director. And Holly Butcher is the Director of Community Development for the City of Cloquet. Thank you both for being here tonight. Uh, Carl, the Northland uh, Connection is all a buzz right now this week because you did get some upgrades. Tell us about that. Sure, so, yeah. The Northland Connection website has been around since 2005, mm -hmm. but uh, 
and we've made some steady upgrades over that time, but this was the first real, you know, complete overhaul of the website. So this was a chance to really you know, go in and re restructure it, bring it up to date, make sure it stays on the cutting edge. This has been a, an award-winning website. It's been a, an important yeah. portal for our region for a long time. I outlined it briefly, but can you give us a little bit more detail? What is the website all about? What's the purpose of it? Sure, so it's meant to be an entry point for anyone looking to, for information on business or economic development across the entire region. So probably its best known tool is the property database. So this is a collection of every building or, pro or site that's for sale, that's c commercial or industrial or, mm -hmm. or office space all across the region. Mm -hmm. That's all on the site there. Yeah. And then we also have a, a bunch of resources that are available for businesses if they're looking to expand, anything from entrepreneurial support to local chambers of commerce to local uh, EDAs, like which, which is what Holly works for. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so well, let's bring Holly into the conversation because you're you're very familiar with the site. You use it in your work. Um, talk about what <coughs> NorthlandConnection.com means for you as an economic developer. Absolutely, so it, it's a very critical piece of mm -hmm. uh, information and tool that I use. So for example, I get a call, a random call from a business that's looking to see what we have for buildings or land opportunities in the community. Instead of trying to remember all of those things, all those buildings and sites, I just go into the tool and I, I get some basic parameters of what they're looking for and I'm able to put together packages of information for businesses and tools that our Economic Development Authority can provide them and give them a really good, solid, quick um, portfolio of what sure. we have as opportunities in Cloquet. Now you work in the city of Cloquet. Has the city benefited from this tool already? We've uh, been funding the tool for probably eight or so years. Um, our Economic Development Authority pri provides roughly $3,000 annually to maintain the website. And so it's on our website. We use it, uh, we, we promote it, and we absolutely use it all the time. Do you monitor all the hits you get? Um, we do not. Carl, Carl does, <laughs> but um, we, you know, we just we, you use it often, and it's been a great sure. tool. And one of the benefits yeah. of the new website is that we can actually monitor the hits we get on every single property now, which wasn't something we could do with the old site. Mm -hmm. the, looking at the site, there's just a ton of data there. You know, mm -hmm. not just the property, but all of the industries and you know everything that uh, might bring a business to this area. Um, how much of economic development these days really is that kind of uh, research and data driven? That's become so much more important mm -hmm. these days. And, and, uh, and not only having data, but making sure that data is easy to understand and accessible and really easy to use, because there's so much out there now. So you need to be able to make your case very clearly and you know, build a narrative and tell a story about why the Northland? Why do you want to come here? And why is this a good place to do business? Mm -hmm. What are some of those competitive advantages as, as you mm -hmm. look at this region? Because you're, you're relatively new with Northspan, but you've been in the economic development business in the region for a while now. Yeah, so I think, I think we have some obvious benefits when it comes to things like cost of living, when it comes to building a workforce here. I think we have some definite advantages. I think there's been growth in, in the region recently, like anything I've ever seen growing up here. I think we've come a long way in the past few years, especially in the Duluth area here, so that's been exciting to see. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have some well-established in industry clusters that we can continue to build on and look for opportunities within you know, our healthcare field, some of our you know, mi mining in industries that we can just keep building on. And so that, that's really wh wh where we focus our efforts at North Bend, is you know, taking the strengths that we have and building on them and just expanding them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Holly, what do you see as the, those key areas that, people, or that businesses are really looking for as they're making that decision? Is it really numbers driven or is it quality of life? Is, is it a whole combination of the package? Carl was kind of starting to hit on it a little uh -huh. bit about uh, how the data is so important. A lot of uh, places use site selectors who are screening information about the region and compiling uh, things and what's important. Um, but transportation, uh, costs, um, land availability, um, access to some of those regional uh, clusters, aviation, things like that are very important. Interstate access, um, all those things um, have been really critical, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. so Carl, if I owned a business, what, what Holly just mentioned, all those different things, that scenario, uh, would uh, that be included in the website that I could look up and perhaps do some further digging once I've learned some basics? Yeah, so all that information is available and on the website, when you, if you select a site, you can get a, a whole range of information on it. Sure. And, and you can export this into P PDF. It's very easy to print out, have that with you. And you can get, so you can very quickly build a list of sites that are perfect options and sort of, sort of go through and see what, what, what fits best for you. I understand that uh, northlandconnection.com 
also um, connects into North Force. Is that a tool that you use as well to try to connect um, employers and employees? So what I do um, is I encourage our, our SAPIs, our engineering firms, um, some of those types of, of businesses, a uh, bolt construction, to make sure that their jobs that they have available are put into North Force. Um, North Force is, is a growing tool, I think, for a lot of people that are looking for jobs. A lot of people are hearing more about it. It's advertised and marketed very well in the mornings. Um, and, and it's just kind of your one-stop shop for a lot of those key jobs that are posted for people that want to come back to the region and uh, look for you know what's appropriate in their field. Mm -hmm. So is that a site then for labor talent? It's for a workforce, exactly, for labor talent, the jobs that are open right now, um, and Apex has been very mm -hmm. instrumental in developing that website. And I'm actually a North Force success story. I found my current job <laughs> on there, so. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> I, I would imagine that one would get a lot of hits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure it does. Yeah. Ha have you found a lot of people are interested in coming back to the region if jobs are available and that they're, they're using that North Force site too? I've certainly seen that because I mean, I grew up here and I went away for college, went away for grad school. You know, I was always hoping to come back, but you know, just kept waiting and looking for the right opportunity and talking to some of my high school friends. It's, it's the same situation. A lot of people love to be here. They just need to find that right opportunity. Mm -hmm. Now, um, both of these are, are regional sites. Um, for so many years, economic development, I think, was very parochial. Mm -hmm. Communities would, would kind of keep all their information hidden mm -hmm. and not want to pass it along mm -hmm. and you know be vying for different, different projects. How much have people come around to really thinking about economic development as something that should be approached from a regional basis? I think people have come a long way and I think it's something uh -huh. that we continue to build on and that's something that we've really focused on at Northspan. We do a lot of work in this area, just facilitating meetings, bringing people together, making sure everyone's on the same page and I think that's something we're going to continue to do and I'm pretty optimistic that we're going to continue to build on that. Do you feel the same way? I mean, parochialism still lives on. We, we, we can't say that it doesn't. <laughs> it, it's absolutely real. But sure. um, I think that uh, we've kind of got our Duluth Superior Cloquet region in 2005, Carleton County was added uh, by the Census Bureau as part of, technically part of the Duluth Superior mm -hmm. Metropolitan Statistical Area. And we are one tied region economically, transportation wise. And, and then we've got the Iron Range. And, and actually, Carl and I both work a lot with the Iron Range economic alliance uh, where we all participate actually well outside of our territories mm -hmm. um, but we are understand you know what the opportunities are and I think we're doing far better than we have historically working absolutely sure. as a region all right so. we've got to go Carl Holly thank you so very much um, appreciate you telling us the story thank you yeah. thank you thank you It's time now for the business headlines from our friends at Business North. After years of testing and refinement, Cirrus Aircraft's personal jet has been certified by the Federal Aviation Administration. The approval will allow Cirrus to begin deliveries of its single-engine vision jet. Like its propeller planes, the turbofan jet features a carbon fiber airframe. It travels much faster, having a cruising speed of nearly 350 miles per hour. The aircraft seats five adults and two children and offers the signature Cirrus airframe parachute system. Production will ramp up throughout 2017, according to the Duluth-based company. Minnesota Power wants to increase rates to cover the cost of recent investments, a request that was immediately met by opposition from the mining industry. The utility also wants regulators to review the rates charged to individual customers, a move that could increase residential rates. The investor-owned utility said its goal is to collect an additional $55 million to support investments as the company transforms to renewable energy generation. The 
increase would have detrimental impacts for the iron mining industry, threatening their worldwide competitiveness, according to Minnesota Iron Mining Association President Kelsey Johnson. Polymet Mining has submitted a formal application now to the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources to mine copper, nickel, and precious metals. The company submitted water-related and air quality permit applications to state agencies earlier this year. This week's permit application addresses mine waste management, wetlands, protection and replacement, and financial assurance. The proposed project has been subject to more than a decade of environmental review. For more on these and other stories, visit businessnorth.com. Well, it's a big weekend for the nearly half million deer hunters expected to participate in the Minnesota firearms deer season. Officials from the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources say growth in the state's deer herd should bode well for hunters. DNR officials shared some tips for hunters getting into the woods this weekend. Each year, over half a million deer hunters go afield uh, for the regular firearm season and so that's a tremendous social and economic uh, impact to Minnesota and, and something that everyone should be very excited about. You need to still pay attention and follow the safety rules. Um, you know, wearing blaze orange, following the rules of firearm safety, specifically knowing your target and what's beyond, and then wearing a full body harness, especially if you're in an elevated tree stand. Um, we're finding more hunters falling out of elevated stands than any other method. Uh, so wearing that full body harness being connected at the time you're in the stand is going to aid a lot in your safety as well. When we talk to hunters we know that getting outside, reconnecting with friends and the experience of deer hunting is very important, often more important than actually harvesting a deer. So I think deer season is always a great tradition in Minnesota and something folks really enjoy and we've had some mild winters and some conservative harvest regulations and hunters are going to likely see some more antler deer, um, more deer on the landscape. I think deer hunting is popular because it's an opportunity to get outside, enjoy nature, also provide food for your family, a great source of protein, and it's also just a great tradition. And so uh, we know that hunters, um, harvesting a deer is not necessarily the most important reason behind going deer hunting. And good luck to all the hunters this weekend. Well, if you have a comment on our show, give us a call. Dial 218-788-2849 to leave a message or send an email to almanacnorth at wdse.org. And don't forget to visit the WDSE website for program listings, updates on your favorite shows, and news about upcoming station events. And Julie, are you going to be out chasing the white-tailed deer this weekend? I'm not, but my husband is out there, although in the past few years he's mostly come home with pictures of deer instead mm. of deer, which is just fine by me. I go to the <laughs> store and buy my meat. <laughs> Most people do. <laughs> <laughs> well, but we hope you have fun. For Julie and the crew at Almanac North, I'm Dennis Anderson. Have a great weekend, everybody. Good night and be kind.